looking at modular arithmetic, that is uh, doing our arithmetic operations uh, with some mod n, mod some number. And we've gone through a number of examples and introduced a few new concepts, so we'll just recap on that. We got to, so we've done mod uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication and division. The, the complex or the confusing ones maybe are subtraction and division. If you do the quiz, you'll get good practice at them. Okay, so that the quiz has simple questions on those operations. We introduced the concept of relatively prime. We'll see an example. Basic, relatively prime means that two numbers are relatively prime if their greatest common divisor is one. So that's easy. It's important in this case that when we do division, we talk about division is really multiplying a number by its multiplicative inverse. Divide by b is the same as multiplying by the inverse of b. Where the multiplicative inverse is when we multiply two numbers together and get one. And that's not, we can't always find an inverse. And the conditions under which we can find an inverse is when in some modulus, so a has a multiplicative inverse in mod n if a is rel relatively prime with n. So if the greatest common divisor of a and n is 1, then a does have an inverse. So not all numbers have an inverse. Then we jump to, we finished on Euler's totient function. Phi is the, the, the symbol there, phi of n. And this function returns the number of it of positive integers less than n and relatively prime to n. So the, the brute force way to find this is to look at all the numbers up until uh, but not including n and then check is this number relatively prime with n? If so then add it to the count, if not then, then don't count it. So just com all the numbers from 1 up until n minus 1 and check whether those numbers are, have a greatest common divisor with n of 1. And we saw a few examples and we'll see some special cases. Just return the, those examples. So we got to, for example, the numbers relatively prime with 4. If we consider the numbers less than 4, we've got 1, 2 and 3 and we see that there are two numbers relatively prime with 4, therefore the Euler's totient, or the, just simply the totient of 4, is 2. It's the count of numbers. Similarly, we did it for the totient of 9, where we said, in this case, we looked at all the numbers, 1 to 8, and see that 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, and 8 are relatively prime with 9, and therefore the, the count is 6. The totient is 6. And we can do it for other numbers. But there are some special cases. If our number n is prime, then it's very easy to find the answer because every number less than a prime is relatively prime with that prime. So the totient of p, if we look at the numbers from 1 up until p minus 1, all of those numbers will be relatively prime with p. Therefore, the count will be p minus 1. So the totient of a prime number, if we know it's a prime, is very easy to find. It's just that prime minus 1. So that's something that can be used to make our life easier to find the totient. And then we finished on an example, and I didn't explain it too much, and it leads to a few questions. Is I said the totient of 35 is the totient of 7 times 5. And under some conditions, and we'll explain them in a moment, that we can expand that to the totient of 7 times the totient of 5, which we know 7 is prime, 5 is prime, so it becomes 6 times 4 gives us 24. And there are a few questions after the lecture under, under what conditions, or there's some conditions when this is tr uh, true or false. So let's look at that. We turn to our lecture notes. And I've updated the lecture notes to be more clear here. So... Euler's totient function, the count of numbers, 
special case, the totion of 1 is 1. For a prime p, the totion of p is p minus 1. Okay, that's because every number less than that prime is, has a greater common divisor with that of 1. Skip this point, which I've introduced, but then I think on your lecture notes you have something that says four primes, p and q, and n equal p times q. To be precise, p and q must be different. So not for primes p and q when p equals q, but only for primes p and q when p and q are different. So I've introduced, and that's the main one you need here, this word different in your lecture notes. Yours says four primes, so I've introduced four different primes. Just to be clear, P and Q are not the same. If P and Q are different, and they are both primes, then it follows that if N equals P times Q, the totion of N equals the totion of P times the totion of Q, or simply P minus 1 times Q minus 1. So just introduce that word different in your lecture slides. There's this previous point that you also don't have, but that's not so important for our topic. I mean, it's nice to know, but it's, uh, we will not use it so much. It says, for any numbers, A and B, where A is relatively prime with B, so they don't have to be primes, but they have to be relatively prime with each other. If n equals a times b, then the totion of n equals the totion of a times the totion of b. So, for example, if b is 7 and a is 4, b is 7, a is 4, are they relatively prime? The greatest common divisor of 7 and 4 is 1, so A and B are relatively prime. 4 and 7 are relatively prime, so this condition is true. Therefore, if N equals 4 times 7, or 28, then the totion of 28 is the totion of 4 times the totion of 7. That's what that uh, statement tells us. And in fact, this, ca this second case for different primes is just a subcase of this one. Okay. Two different primes are always relatively prime with each other. If we have two primes, 7 and 11, their greatest common divisor must be 1 by the fact that they're both different primes. It turns out when we look at security and cryptography, and one particular algorithm we'll look at makes use of this statement. The totion of n, when n equals the multiplication of two primes, p and q, we can calculate it very easily by just taking p minus 1, q minus 1, and multiply together. We don't have to count all the values or check all the values up until n minus 1. It, this is a shortcut that we can use. And that will become important because it turns out to to check, check all the val values up to n minus 1 takes a long time. If n is large enough, there are no known solutions to doing that in reasonable time. And that will be a security feature of some algorithms. So just return to some ex examples for that one. Are A and B relatively prime? Yes, the greatest common divisor is 1, so they are relatively prime. So that first statement holds, that is, if we say the totion of 5 times 6 or the totion of 30 
rather than calculating it by looking from the numbers from 1 up until 29 and checking them all, we know that it's equal to the totient of 5 times the totient of 6. So calculating the totient of smaller numbers is easier. There are less numbers to try. And in fact, when one of them's prime, the totient of 5 is 4 of 6. 6 is not prime, so we can check 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. 1 is relatively prime with 6. 2 is not. 3 is not. 4 is not. 5 is. So 2 is the answer there. 4 times 2. So the totient of 30 equals 8. We don't have to calculate in the, 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 the brute force way of trying all the numbers up until 29. And that's, that's important not just for your quizzes and exams when you need to calculate a totient, but in a computer when you have a very large number, the computer can calculate much faster by breaking it down into uh, two mo numbers multiplied together. But in fact, we will not see this one so much. That was an example of this new statement, which I think you don't have in your lecture notes. The second one we'll see more often. Let's say we have some prime P is 7, Q is 11. There are two prime numbers. What's the totient of 77? It's the same principle, the same rule as we use here. These two numbers are relatively prime, so we can break that down to the totient of 7 times the totient of 11, because 7 and 11 are relatively prime. Totient of 7 is 6 times 10, we get 60. Or simply P minus 1 times Q minus 1. And that's something that we'll take advantage of uh, in some security algorithms. So think of it as a shortcut. If we know if we know that 77, uh, we think, ah, uh, 77, rather than checking 1 up into 76, we know that 77 can be factored into two primes, 7 and 11. And we know from that, it's easy to calculate the totient. It's 7 minus 1 times 11 minus 1. So if we have the totient of some number n, and if we can factor that number n into it's two prime factors, that is n is made up of multiplying two primes together, then it's easy to calculate the totient of n. Any questions before we move on? One more example. Solve the totient of 143. And I'm not so mean that I'll require you to check 1 up to 142. Try and look for a shortcut in this case.
So the hint here, can we, or the approach that we can try is, can we factor 143 into two primes? Two primes multiplied together get 143, then the approach that you could take is try a few primes. And you know they're relatively small primes in this case. And if you try some, which ones do you come up with? Something times something is 143. What? Eleven and thirteen. So in fact, 143 can be factored into the two primes, 11 and 13. Now that we know that, we can do the totient quite easily. Any questions? Yep. The totient of 49. What do we do with that? 7 and 7. Are 7 and 7 relatively prime with each other? What's the greatest common divisor of 7 and 7? It's not 1. They can both be divided by 7. So they are not relatively prime, so these two conditions, the general one doesn't hold. The two numbers need to be relatively prime for this, for this to be true. Or, if we're dealing with primes, the two primes need to be different. If P and Q are the same, then this doesn't work. The, 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 the equation doesn't hold. Okay. And that's what I, I didn't make clear in the, the lecture last uh, last week, P and Q must be different. They cannot be the same. If they are the same, there's another way to calculate what the totient is. Okay, there is another way, but we just don't use that. We, Don't use this in the quiz. In the quiz, you calculate yourself. But this is just a table of, of the totient of the first, I, I think, 1 up to 500. And seven and seven, the totient of 49 is 42 turns out the divisors of 49 are 1 and 49 plus 7, that common prime. So there is a way in that case to calculate the totient of two primes multiplied together when those primes are the same. 49 is 1, the divisors are 1, 7 and 49. 60, uh, sorry, what's another one? 25. The divisors are 1, 5, and 25. There's an, a way to calculate the totient of those numbers as well, but we don't use that. Any other questions on the totient function? Then look, let's look at uh, two, two theorems that we'll make use of as well in, in the subsequent cryptographic algorithms. So the reason we're talking about all this is in the, the next topics we're going to use this to, to uh, understand some encryption algorithms. And we'll not prove or, or explain really the, the theorems, we'll just state them and use them to, to solve some problems. So Euler, who, who developed the totient function, there's also Euler's theorem. And there are two forms of it. We'll, so can be modified, this theorem, uh, to take two different forms. The first form says that for every a and n, where those two numbers are relatively prime, if we have two numbers relatively prime, then it holds that a to the totient of n 
is equivalent to 1 when we mod by n. Or in other words, a to the totion of n mod n equals 1. A, a variation of that, so it's really the same theorem but just uh, some conditions changed. If we have two positive integers, a and n, they don't need to be relatively prime in this, this variation. Then it holds that a to the totion of n plus 1 mod n equals a. Let's just demonstrate that. Uh, With, with a couple of simple examples. And we'll just demonstrate the second form. Solve this one. 97 to the power of 121 mod 143. What are you going to do? No calculator allowed. Yep. The totion of 6 is 2. There are two numbers less than 6 that are relatively prime with 6. 6 is not prime, so it's not simply 5. Back to this question. Use Euler's theorem to solve it. So think of it in the term of Euler's theorem, the second form that we saw. Of course, we could we could manually solve it, that is we could try and break it down uh, or use our computer or calculators to, to calculate what it is and we may do in a moment but the point is that can we simplify this using one of the things that we already know and we just introduced Euler's theorem, if we look at the second form it tells us if we have some number a raise it to some power the totion of n plus 1 and we mod by n then the result will be that A again, the base. Does this, uh, does this statement match that theorem? I'll just write what Euler's theorem was. That Remember when we say that they're equivalent in, in mod n in brackets, it's the same as saying we, we mod one number by n, we get the, the a here. Can you find the, the values that match in this case? We just calculated, I think. In the previous example of the totient function, we said that the totient of 143 is in fact the totient of the two prime factors, 11 and 13, multiplied together, which is 10 times 12, which is 120. So that was our previous example of the totient function then 
now that we know that, then we see that this statement does match Euler's theorem. We have some number A, 97. We raise it to the power of the totion of n. n is 143. The totion of 143 is 120. We take our number A and raise it to the power of 120 plus 1. So it does match this, this form. So what's the answer going to be? 97. So this is just an example of how we can use Euler's theorem to solve, uh, to solve a problem. Of course, to do that, we need to, to realize that it does hold the form of Euler's theorem. Not all, all problems do, of course. Ninety seven to the power of one hundred and twenty plus one. One hundred and twenty is the totion of one hundred and forty three, so it does hold this form, so therefore the answer is ninety seven. Let's check that with a calculator. Ninety seven to the power of, what was it, 121 mod 143. Let's hope it works. 97, okay? My calculator confirms that in, in this case it's correct. So we're not going to prove Euler's theorem, we're going to use it to, to solve some problems. To make finding a solution to some problems, especially when we have large numbers, much easier by using that theorem. We'll see some other examples of that later. Let's look at a different theorem that's useful. And we go back a slide, I think. Fermat's theorem. Again, in two forms. The first form, briefly, if we have some prime p, and some integer a that is not divisible by that prime p, then it holds that a to the power of p minus 1 is equivalent to 1 in mod p. All right, let's go to the second form, which is what the one we'll, we'll use in practice, at least in this course. If we have a prime p and a positive integer a, and there's no condition about being divisible here, but just a prime p and an integer a, then it holds that a to the power of p is equal to a when we mod by p. Similar but slightly different than Euler's theorem. So a to the power of p mod p equals a. That tells us if p is prime. Let's use that one to solve a, a brief pro problem. Answer? And I'll repeat the, the theorem here that said that a to the power of p, where p is a prime number, it must be prime, mod p equals a. And it turns out that our, our question in this case holds that form. I've selected it such that we have an integer a or 3 raised to the power of some prime 5 mod by that same prime then Fermat's theorem tells us that the answer will be the integer a. Again, we don't attempt to prove that. We'll just make use of it to make our life easier in, in solving some problems later.
Of course, this one you can quite easily do in your head anyway. 3 to the power of 5 is something. 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 is 27, times 3 is 81, times 3 243. 243 mod 5, the remainder will be 3. All right. So this one with small numbers we can solve, but again when we deal with large numbers, using Fermat's theorem makes our life easier. We can solve it faster. Well, inter any questions? Something to the power of 3. 3 to the power of 3. Try it. You mean 3 to the power of 3 mod 3. What's 3 mod 3? Remember when we mod by... So when we mod by 5, the numbers here, really the numbers are, that we deal with is 0 up to 4. If we had 5 to the power of 5, 5 is equivalent to 0 in mod 5. So three, if you had 3 to the power of 3 mod 3, 3 to the power of 3, that base is equivalent to 0. Mod 3, we really deal with the integers from 0 up to 2. Okay, so it still holds in that case. If it was 4, uh, sorry, if in this case it was 6 to the power of 5 mod 5, it's the same as 1 to the power of 5 mod 5, because 6 equals 1 in mod 5. Any other questions? We'll have some more examples in a moment. We'll introduce one more concept. It's, I think, the last one in this topic, and then we'll go through a few different examples. Just to repeat, the question was, as an example, what if we have a different one? 3 to the power of 3 mod 3, where this is our prime, and it's repeated here. What's the answer? Well, we just note that this, so what do we get? 0, is it, is it true? Does the, does the theorem hold? 0 is equal to 3 in mod 3. That is, these two values are equivalent. In mod 3, 0 and 3 are the same. Does that answer your question or, or make it a little bit clearer? Okay, so we need to be careful when we're still by mod by 3 in this case. Let's look at the last concept, which leads us to exponentiation and eventually logarithms. So this is uh, modular exponentiation. Exponentiation raised something to the power. So this was 3 to the power of 3 mod some number, and we use the theorem to solve that, but we could do it manually in that case. So we've gone through the operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and we said that division is multiplied by the multiplicative inverse. And the multiplicative inverse doesn't exist for all numbers, only under certain conditions. So we can't divide by anything in modular arithmetic. We will not get an answer. So the, the last two operations are really extensions of 
the, the previous two, exponentiation, raising something to the power, is just multiplying many times. And it's very easy to solve. Uh, we just do our normal exponentiation and then mod by n. So exponentiation is easy. So 10 to the power of uh, 7 mod by 20, we just take 10 to the power of 7 and mod by 20. The, the rules that, uh, of our arithmetic uh, match in that case. But what's the opposite of exponentiation? Logarithms. That gives us the inverse operation. That's a little bit more confusing. Same with div division. With division, there's not always a multiplicative inverse. We couldn't always divide. Similar with logarithms, we can't always find uh, the logarithm in modular arithmetic. So we'll look at the conditions because we'll make use of this again in a different uh, cryptographic algorithm. Return to normal, normal arithmetic. So our, our basic mathematics. We know if b equals a to the power of i, so i is the index or the exponent. If b equals a to the power of i, so that's expens ex exponentiation, then the inverse operation is logarithm, and we write it as the index i equals the log in base a of b. So that's just our normal logarithms. It's the inverse where we find the index in some base. a to the power of i equals b. Log of b in base a equals i. In modular arithmetic, we just introduce the, the modulus mod p in this uh, definition, we say if b equals a to the power of i mod p, then the inverse operation is the logarithm in base a with mod p, so we introduce the mod, the way we write it is we uh, introduce two subscripts, one includes the base, the other is the modulus, of b returns the index i. And it's commonly referred to as the discrete logarithm. So d log is written here. So that we don't talk about simply the logarithm in modular arithmetic. We simply call it a discrete logarithm. Let's look at a, a couple of examples and then look at the conditions when it works. To keep it simple, let's start without modular arithmetic, but just our normal arithmetic, so everyone uh, is, is clear. What's 2 to the power of 6? You all know your binary values. 2 to the power of 6, you just remember 64. Normal arithmetic. What's log in base 2 of 64? Okay. It's the index. Okay, so that, just remember, that's all logarithm is, is returns the index. When we uh, some base to, to the power of some index gives us 64. What is the index? Now let's switch to modular arithmetic. Let me find a good example.
3 to the power of 2 mod 7. 9 mod 7. Easy. 2. So we can say the discrete log, the base is 3, the modulus is 7. So the discrete log, and not the best of examples, but we'll see another one. The discrete log of this 2 equals the index, which just turns out also to be 2. That is, equals this 2 here. Try another one. 3 to the power of 3 mod 7. Answer. 27 mod 7. 6. So the discrete log, the base is 3. The modulus is 7. The discrete log of 6 is the index 3. So that we can read the discrete log is what number do we raise the base 3 to and then mod by 7 to get an answer of 6. That number is 3. Try some more. What's the discrete log in base 3, modulus 7 of 5? Try and find that one. That is, we have a base of 3, we raise it to some power, then mod by 7 and gives us the answer of 5, what is that power? Three to the power of something mod seven should equal five. What is that something? Try. Calculator may be used. 3 to the power of 2, let's try some numbers. What about 1? 3 to the power of 1 mod 7, does it equal 5? No. 3 to the power of 2 mod 7, no, we've done that before. 3 to the power of 3 mod 7, no, that equals 6. What about 3 to the power of 4 mod 7? What's 3 to the power of 4? 81 mod 7. eighty one mod seven is four. We need five as the answer. So let's try again. Three to the power of five. Two hundred and forty three mod seven. Calculator time. Confirm. Check. 243 mod 7. What's the remainder when we divide by 7? If you have one of those communication devices that you put to your ear, a phone, then you can use the calculator on it. 
It turns out to be 5. 243 mod 7 is 5. So our answer of the discrete log, 3 to the power of 5, mod 7 equals 5. So the discrete log of 5, base 3, mod 7 is 5. As you may guess, taking that approach of finding the answer when we have large numbers may take a long time. Because what we did is we tried what, was the, what if it's uh, exponent 1, or no, that didn't work, 2, no, 3, 4, and keep going until we got the answer. If we have a very large number, then we have to make many attempts to find the answer, which takes a long time. All of these were using the same base and the same modulus. Let's try some different ones. Discrete log. Let's change the base. Base 2. Keep the same modulus, 7. Discrete log of 4, base 2, mod 7. Let's write it from the inverse perspective. That means the base is 2, 2 to the power of something, mod 7 equals 4. What is that something? You're correct. Anyone else? What's, what's that something? 2 is the first something. 2 to the power of 2 mod 7 gives us 4. Okay, easy. But are there other answers? What about 5? 2 to the power of 5 is 32 mod 7 is 4. There are in fact multiple answers in this case. So yes, it could be here we could have had 2 or maybe it was 5. So in this case we say we cannot find a unique exponent. We don't know whether it's 2 or 5. So we say we cannot find the discrete logarithm of 4, or we'll consider that we cannot find a unique value. And so it could be 2 or 5. Or in fact, other answers if we keep going up larger than 7. But in terms of the exponents less than the modulus, 2 or 5 are possible solutions here. Which one was it if we take it as an inverse operation? We don't know. So this presents a case which uh, if we are trying to find the inverse of some uh, exponentiation, trying to find out what the exponent someone used, then this will not necessarily tell us the unique answer. It will give us multiple answers. And for security purposes, what we want is, so the algorithms that make use of the discrete logarithm have to have a condition such that the answer is unique. So we want to consider the cases where only where the discrete logarithm will give one unique answer. It will not give multiple possible answers. And that leads to the, some cases where we say we cannot find the discrete logarithm of some numbers, or we cannot find a unique discrete logarithm of some numbers. In the same way that we could not find the multiplicative inverse or divide by some numbers. And that becomes important in how we uh, use discrete logarithm in different algorithms. So let's look at those conditions, or let's at least state them. So a unique exponent 
can be found if A, the base, is a primitive root of prime P. So we introduce a new condition. So let's say we only want to find uh, do discrete logs when we find a unique value. So the conditions when that will be the case is when our base is a primitive root of prime P. That is P, the modulus, is prime. And now we need to say what is primitive root. And, well, primitive root is a, is, uh, a number when we raise it to the power to each different possible exponent will get a unique value. Let's see that. Let's try. Try some different numbers and we'll explain a primitive root. So I was doing some examples in mod 7, so we'll stick with mod 7 at the moment. So think that we have 7 is a prime number, so that is good. So in general we think a to the mod a to the power of i mod 7 gives us some value. I'll write the possible values as a table. A to the power of 1, well let's consider the values up until 7. So 1, 2, 2 to, to show an example of primitive roots. And now let's consider, so if A is 1, and we raise it to the power of 1, and then mod by 7, we get an answer of 1. 6 to the power of 1, mod 7 is 6. So these are the base cases. What we'll do is consider, what if we raise A to the power of 2, What is A in this case? These are the values of A. A to the if A is 1, A to the power of 1, mod 7 is 1. Let's consider this. If A is 1, what's 1 squared mod 7? 1 cubed mod 7? 1 to the power of 4 mod 7? Those ones are easy. Let's try if A is 2. 2 squared mod 7? 4. 2 to the power of 3 mod 7? So 8 mod 7? 2 to the power of 4 mod 7? 16 mod 7? <coughs> 2 to the power of 5? 32 mod 7? 2 to the power of 6 mod 7 should be 1. If you see some pattern, it is 1. Let's keep going. 3 to the 3 squared mod 7. 3 cubed, 27 mod 7. Three, we did these ones before. 3 to the power of 4 mod 7. 83, was it? 81 mod 7. 4, 3 to the power of 5 mod 7, we did that before, we found it was 2. 3 to the power of 6 mod 7, calculator. <laughs> 3 to the power of 6 mod 7, 1. And we'll do the rest in the calculator, you'll see. 4 squared mod 7, you'll remember 2, 4 to the power of 3, 4 to the power of 4, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 are the exponents, we get answers of 2, 1, 4, 2, 1.
and we'll do it for five. Five squared mod seven cubed to the power of four. We get the answers four, six, two, three, one. Last one for six. Six squared to the power of mod seven. The answers are one, six, one, six, one. A primitive root of prime 7 is a number such that when we raise it to each of the possible exponents less than 7 gives us a unique value. That is, there's no repetition in those rows. Let's see. Where's the unique values? And you see the pattern. In this row, there's only one value. Here we have repetition. These three values, then we repeat. Here we have the entire row. That is, three, when A is three, we raise it to any power from 1 to 6 and mod by 7, the answers will be distinct. No repetitions. If it's 4, again we get repetition. Again with 5, we get distinct values. These are the different values of A, the, the base. And here we just get repetition of two values. Three and five are primitive roots of seven, we say. 3 to the power of anything less than 7 will give us a distinct value when we mod by 7. Similar with 5. Which means if we have a base of 3 or 5, we can find a unique discrete logarithm. You can use that table to check. the base is 3, the modulus is 7, the discrete log of 6, remember we read the discrete log or we can think about it as 3 to the power of something mod by 7 equals 6. In fact we've solved that already. We say 3 to the power of 3 mod by 7 gives us 6. So the discrete log is 3 in that case. And we've seen these examples before. The point is, for any number here, 1 through to 6, we'll get a dis one value as an output here. But if we try to do the discrete logarithm in base 2, then there are multiple possible exponents that give us that answer. So normally with discrete log we want to get a unique exponent and to do so we need 
to have a base which is a primitive root of the modulus. That will be a condition we'll see in an, a cryptographic algorithm a little bit later in the course. Questions? Some new concepts today? Any questions at the back? All too easy? There's some parts not so easy. Let's look at another example. It's on the slide. So recapping what we said. The discrete logarithm, the logarithm is the inverse of exponential. So we say the discrete logarithm, when we have a base A mod by P, if we get an answer B, then what's the exponent? I. But we don't always get a unique exponent. So we usually want to find values such that there will be a unique exponent I, and that can be found if the base A is a primitive root of prime P. So if we set P to be prime, and select A to be appropriate, then we will find a unique exponent, a unique, unique answer in that case. And we went through an example illustrating what do we mean by primitive root when we take some, prime, uh, some base A and raise it to the powers up until that prime, then we get unique answers. And that is a primitive root. Turns out only some integers uh, that have primitive roots or there are some pattern of integers that have primitive roots, 2, 4, some prime to the power of some integer, alpha in this case, or 2 times prime, some prime to the power of some integer. So not all numbers will have uh, primitive roots. Generally, if we choose P to be a prime or an odd prime, so uh, that covers all the, in this case, then we can find a primitive root. Finding the discrete logarithm of some number, even though we know there's a unique answer, it's not fast to do if we deal with large numbers. We used an example where we tried to find by checking each exponent and see if it gives, gives us the answer. In general, solving the discrete logarithm for large numbers is considered practically impossible if those numbers are large enough. And that will be another thing that we'll use in security algorithms. And we'll summarize some of those computational challenges, and then we'll finish today with a few more examples. Oh, this example shows our table, but for mod 19. Okay. That is, from 1 up until 18, A equals, for example, 5. 5 to the power of 1, mod 19 is 5. 5 to the power of 2, mod 19 is 6. 5 to the power of 3, mod 19 is 11, and so on. And it's done it for all of the values. So what are the primitive roots of 19? The primitive roots are those where we get unique values as all the answers. So 2... 3, 10, 13, 14, and 15 are the primitive roots of 19. And this shows some discrete logarithms of, in modulus 19. So it takes those six rows from the previous table, just those which are primitive roots, and then you can find the discrete logarithm by a lookup in this case. For example, when the base is 3, so log base 3 mod 19 of 8 returns 3. 
we may see that in some examples later, or you can use that to solve some problems. Let's finish on this slide. We've gone through different aspects of number theory, and they're all going to be relevant for how we, or how people have designed some cryptographic algorithms for, for security. And I've mentioned, mentioned them along the way, but there are some of the problems that we've seen which are considered computationally hard. By computationally hard, we mean if we have la uh, values large enough, then there are no known algorithms that can find the solution in reasonable time. Similar like a brute force attack. A brute force attack, we say if the key is large enough, there are no known ways to find the key within uh, a reasonable time. And the three problems are factoring a large number n into its two primes. That is, if we know that n equals the multiplication of two different primes, p and q, so if we know n and are trying to find p and q, then if those values are large enough, we will not be able to find p and q. That's the problem here. Factoring a large number into its two primes is considered computationally hard. And there have been some tests or some challenges, and we may see some newer ones later, but a few years ago, the largest number that could be factored into two primes was 232 decimal digits long. Okay, so if you write it down, it had uh, 232 digits. So that's what we mean by large in that case. And it took uh, thousands of man years of compute power to factor that one number into the two primes P and Q. So if you have a much larger number, then it's considered impossible to, to factor it into its primes P and Q. Integer factorization. Another problem which is considered hard and actually considered even harder for integer factor harder than integer factorization is finding Euler's totient. If you're given some value n if you're given some composite value n, so it's not prime, then finding the totient of n is considered impossible to do if it's large enough. The only way that you can do it is if you know that n is, a is made up of multiplying two primes, p and q, together. Because if we know that n equals p times q, it's very easy to solve. The totient of n is simply the totient of p times the totient of q. But if we know n, but we don't know that uh, the prime factors of n, finding the totient, think about checking, is 2 relatively prime with n? Is 3 relatively prime with n? And so on. That approach, if n is large enough, cannot be solved in reasonable time. And the last one is solving discrete logarithms. Find the exponent. When you're given the base, some base A, some modulus P, find the discrete logarithm of B. Again, that's considered, uh, when we have l numbers large enough, uh, impossible to solve. We'll use those in the next topics to explain how uh, different security algorithms are considered secure. So start with some simple examples. I'll write them, you solve them. The totient of 23, find the answer. 149 to the power of 133, mod 161, find the answer.
find the discrete log of, 30, of 3 when we have a base of 2 mod n. And for the discrete logarithm, you can use the tables in the, in the slides that uh, give you the cases for modulus 19. Answer for the first one. Should be almost immediate because you realize that 23 is a prime. So you don't have to check 1, 2, 3 up until 22. You know 23 is a prime. Therefore, the answer is 23 minus 1. The prime minus 1. Because all numbers up until... Uh, and less than 23 are relatively prime with 23. So that was an easy one. Next one, how do you solve it? Hint, don't try and do it manually. Use one of the theorems that we've given you. Look up some of those theorems and see if it matches the pattern of one of those theorems. Look at the theorems that you have in, in the, the lecture notes. And I'll highlight the, the main ones. So with the red, uh, the second form of Fermat's theorem is one that you can make use of. If we have a prime P, A to the power of that prime is equal to A when we mod by P. The other one, we just use one of the, the shortcuts for Euler's totient function. We use the one that the totient of a prime p equals p minus 1. Another useful one to remember is the, the totient of n when n is, has two prime divisors of p and q. And then the totient of n is the totient of p times the totient of q or simply p minus 1 times q minus 1. That's another uh, theorem to, to use. Euler's theorem a to the power of the totient of n plus 1 equals a mod n. Try one of them to find out what 149 to the power of 133 mod 161 is. See if one of those theorems can be used to solve that. And the hint is one of them can be. Which theorem are you going to use? Well, let's try. What does Fermat's theorem say? A to the power of P mod P, P is prime, equals A. That is, a to the power of p is equivalent to a when we mod everything by p. Does our question match that form of the equation? Do we have some integer raised to the power of some prime p and mod by that same prime p? No, we've got raised to the power of 133 mod by 161, so it doesn't directly match that. So that suggests that maybe this isn't going to be of any help at this stage. Try the other, Euler's theorem. A to the power of the totient of n plus 1 mod n equals a. A to the power of something, the totient of n plus 1, mod by something else, n, will give us a. 
under the conditions that, of course, the exponent is the totion of n plus 1. Does that one work? Yes, no, maybe? Well, we, let's check. What's the totion of n? If n is 161, what's the totion of 161? Again, it's a little bit too hard to manually for us in, in this short time to calculate, so use one of our shortcuts and realize that's actually, what, 23 times 7? 161, if we factorize that into its primes, is 23 times 7. And we know now the totion of two primes multiplied together is the totion of the primes multiplied and the totion of a prime is easy 22 times 6 is what? 132 so in fact it does match this form we see that we have 149 to the power of 132 plus 1 mod 161. And Euler's theorem says some integer a to the power of the totion of n, well, if n is 161, the totion of n is 132 plus 1 gives us 133, so it does match in that case. So the answer? is 149. So here it's just a matter of finding the theorem that uh, matches the, the, the question. Discrete log in base 2 of 3 when we mod by 19. Go to your slides and look it up. Look at that table that calculates all of the uh, base a to the power of some I exponent mod by 19. So for this one, we'll just fit it in here. We think, well, we have 2 to the power of something mod 19 equals 3. What is that something? Well, the table tells us. We, we could use a calculator, but the slides tell us that. That is, this example tell us, tells us that 2, the base, 2 to the power of something, one of these numbers, gives us an answer of 3. 2 to the power of 13 mod by 19 gives us 3. So the exponent is 13. That's because the slides already calculated that for us. And you could check that. Therefore the discrete log of 3 base 2 mod 19 is 13. I would not expect you to calculate that for very large numbers, uh, but if you were given that table or for small numbers like 7, you could calculate the discrete log. If, if you didn't follow the use of Euler's theorem here, tonight you'll go home and solve this last one. I have it. Write this one down.
solve that one. Not by just guessing the theorem, but going through the steps to find out how would you get to the answer. We'll see you on Friday. Make sure you do your homework, do the number theory questions, and try and solve that one.